For the depressive disorders, we'll look at four specific disorders, major depressive disorder, and we'll tackle what a uh, specifier is later on in the chapter, persistent depressive mood disorder, premenstrual disorder, and the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, since it's a child and adolescence uh, associated disorder, we'll wait to cover that in chapter 16. For the bipolar disorders, we'll cover bipolar disorder 1 and 2, and a condition called cyclothymic disorder, or sometimes called cyclothemia. So that's an overview, and that should be helpful. Make sure that you could, if I ask you the bipolar disorders, you could rail off what we put under that category, and if we listed the depressive disorders, that you could easily rattle off the ones under that category. The current slide has various terms that we should become comfortable with. Uh, first, you should know that major depression is the same thing as major depressive disorder, and that is the same thing as unipolar depression. So make sure that you can use these words comfortably interchangeably. Next, endogenous versus event-related. Endogenous refers to naturally occurring, so this would be a depression, at least for this chapter, that's not caused by an outside event. It's related to the machinery, if you want to call it that, that regulates neurotransmitters having issues. Versus event-related, obviously the depression or other mental health issue is related to an external event. It could be a chronic long-term stressor, or it could be a uh, severe trauma, but in any case, external. Next, MICA. If you've never heard before, it stands for mentally ill and chemically addicted. Affect is just another common word in our subject area for mood. So oftentimes the mood disorders are called the affect disorders. Next, pressured speech. It could be rapid or frenzied, fragmented, or just really loud. Flight of ideas, rapidly changing ideas, uh, or disjointed thoughts. Rumination, think of maybe a cow or a other bovine as being a ruminant. They uh, chew their cud, so they keep chewing and chewing. So in this context, excessively thinking about certain topics over and over and over often associated with irrational beliefs, like I must be perfect, I can't make a mistake, everybody must like me, and so on. Our last term, lack of insight. They cannot see their behaviors as others would. So perhaps uh, think of an example of a hoarder. Others are appalled and horrified. The person just said, oh, just a little bit messy. Uh, maybe a person with uh, a manic phase can't see how erratic and self-destructive their behavior seem to others. So review the slide in terms until you're very comfortable with the terms. It shouldn't take too long. So let's start the chapter considering major depression. Take a moment and see if you can list one or two of the other terms you learned were interchangeable with major depression. Hopefully, either major depressive disorder or unipolar depression came to mind. The diagnosis is, take a guess, do you think it's going to be weeks or months of symptoms, and how many? It would actually be after two weeks of symptoms. It's so common that it gets itself the name the common cold of mental illness. Lifetime prevalence is different for men versus women, being more common in women. One in four women, 25%, will have an episode, one or more that is, of major depression, and about half that number of men. The risk of a second episode? Well, if the depression was severe, half of people will go on to have a second episode. And I don't know if that's good or bad. That means half will, but that also means that half won't. And it's less likely if the depression was not severe, so half. We'll consider the criteria for diagnosis and the subtypes in our next slide.
Hopefully you remember the phrase diagnostic criteria back from our discussion of the DSM. That was the part that was Chinese menu-like, if you wish. Uh, for major depressive disorder, at least five of the following would need to be present. So let's consider. Mood would be extremely sad and hopeless. Often a sense of worthlessness or guilt. Decrease in interest and no pleasure when they do things. Constant fatigue. Weight change, uh, either up or down, but usually down. Daily sleep change. Could be sleeping more or less, but typically sleeping a lot more. You call them at I don't, 3 in the afternoon they're asleep. You call them at 8 o'clock at night they're asleep. So typically increased sleep. Motor symptoms, either being restless, agitated, or moving and even thinking slowly. Impaired thinking, such as the ability to concentrate and learn. The DSM does not include anger, but it's common enough that I thought I'd add it to the slide. And the DSM does mention thoughts of death. So again, five or more would need to be present for our diagnosis. You've probably heard terms like postpartum depression or seasonal affective disorder. They're not significantly different than major depression. We use the term uh, onset specifier. So basically, it's a major depression episode associated with a certain trigger. For postpartum onset, it would be, a, or sorry, peripartum onset. It refers to around the time of birth, though many People use the term postpartum depression, an older term. Uh, seasonal affective disorder, again, has that uh, onset specifier. So basically, it's just saying that you have major depressive disorder with a certain trigger. Now, peripartum, as I mentioned, refers to depression occurring around the time of birth. So it could be several weeks before, it could be several weeks or more after. It's more than the baby blues. It's true major depression. It affects up to 15% of new moms and, as noted, it has the same criteria for major depressive disorder. Fairly recently, that is in 2019, the first drug specific to peripartum depression was approved. Uh, the name, as you can see, very tiny print. It means you do not have to necessarily learn it. Zoloresso is very helpful, but must be given under medical supervision and given as an infusion over three days. It's very different than any other antidepressant in that it's not targeting a neurotransmitter. It's targeting a hormone that decreases tremendously after childbirth, basically restoring the hormone to pregnancy levels and helping the woman uh, move through the depressive uh, episode. So very different and uh, very useful for many women that suffer from peripartum depression. Let's now consider another form of depression that also has an onset specifier. So again, major depression with a very specific tr trigger uh, this disorder is known as the acronym SAD. You probably know it as seasonal affective disorder. And again, there's that use of the word affect for mood that we learned earlier in the chapter. So basically, it's a type of major depression, but with a seasonal pattern occurring in late winter and early spring. And so what about late winter and early spring? Is it perhaps seasonal holiday shopping? Uh, no. As you probably know, it's triggered by lack of light. So people in Hawaii or Buenos Aires would not suffer from this, but people in our climate where the days get shorter and shorter and the light is weaker and weaker, and we spend very little time out in the light and our bodies are all bundled up, and a lot of times we're wearing sunglasses for the winter glare, uh, this lack of light in some triggers SAD. It's very typical with a person with SAD craves carbs and may often gain weight due to eating a lot of carb-related foods. Treatments could be the antidepressants, but many times would include light therapy either alone 
or in combination with antidepressants. And there are all sorts of light delivery apparatus that are approved by the FA, FDA, and many are included in health insurance plans. Let's next consider PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. It, unlike seasonal affective disorder or peripartum depression, is not considered to be an onset specifier. It's given it's a full category of depressive illness. Uh, this depression, many people get confused and they think, ah, the woman is menstruating. Well, that's a bad road to go down. And no, the pre in it means it's before menstruation. It actually improves when menses arrive. It is uh, treatable, uh, obviously with a hormonal, uh, if it's hormonally instigated, hormonal treatments often work best. It's often treated with hormonal birth control. Characteristics, uh, symptoms of it include depression, uh, irritability, anxiety, and or mood swings. And again, uh, this is the premenstrual time, not the menstrual time. Let's consider another depressive disorder. Again, not an onset specifier, but a true depressive disorder. This is persistent depressive disorder. The person must meet the criteria for major depression, but the difference in major depressive disorder and persistent depressive disorder is that the symptoms must be present for at least two years. Now, if you're wondering why I chose this particular picture, many men that are alcoholic are actually suffering from a depressive disorder and they're self-treating with alcohol, creating two issues instead of one. Let's consider treatment options for major depression, starting with psychotherapy. Treatment is essential. Not only do the different depressive disorders take the joy out of living, but they also put a person at risk for self-harm or even suicide. The suicide rate of people with major depressive disorders is 17 times that of the general population. For many mental health conditions, the most effective course of action would be psychotherapy combined with medications. But many people approach it as an either or. So for a moment, let's take a look at it from that particular angle. Consider the possible benefits of psychotherapy over medication. List as many possible benefits, again, of therapy as you can. If we're in class, we'll do this together. Well, there are many benefits. Many medications have side effects. Some cause dependence or addiction. Some, uh, well, let's not say some, the lifetime cost of therapy is cheaper than the lifetime cost of taking the medication. Another cons consideration is that some drugs some medications can be toxic and can actually be an instrument for self-harm or suicide. Clearly not the case with uh, therapy. And also, the medication is not many times addressing the root cause and is not giving the person new skills to help them adapt and cope with the particular mental disorder. So both is almost always best, but if you have to choose one or the other, perhaps consider therapy. At this point, please click the two links and take notes. You never know when the question will appear on a quiz and or test. Let's consider some of the major therapy types and perhaps a tool or two for some. 
first major option, behavioral or CBT treatment. CB, of course, cognitive. A very common uh, tool is the focus on problem solving versus the avoidance of problems. Most of us like to avoid pain, but the avoidance of unpleasantry can actually increase anxiety and depression. So problem solving for some people is part of the therapy. Pleasure exercises. So depressed people often withdraw from people and activities. So for pleasure exercise, you'd be signed to do things that you were used to enjoy doing in the past, or if the person maybe has very little of pleasure in their past, they might be given uh, things to try. Going to a theater, going to a presentation, going bowling, what have you. And initially the person probably does not feel pleasure, but this will help to address the brain issues and by and by they will start to feel more and more enjoyment. Now we've mentioned mindfulness CBT and dialectical CBT throughout the course. Just a brief, really minimal refresher. The mindfulness is being aware in a non-judgmental fashion of one's thoughts and feelings. So rather than judging yourself, becoming aware, becoming mindful of the moment. It's simplification, but it's the essence of that particular therapy. Next, the one that I think is highly effective, even more so, is dialectical CBT. Giving the person the tools to endure distress, to be able to tolerate distress, because many things in life we cannot adjust. And also, to regulate one's emotions and social skills to help us act more effectively and hopefully also help us to avoid distress. Of course, there are many variations in therapy beyond CBT and uh, behavior therapy, but they are so effective, they're often a uh, first line of choice for many therapists. Let's learn a lot more about DBT. What does it stand for? Well, from the previous slide, let's see, what is that D? If you're thinking dialectical, you're right. So it's a dialectical behavior therapy developed by Marsha Lenihan. She used it with borderline personality disorder, but since then it is the preferred treatment of many conditions, including anxiety, depression, and so many more. It balances acceptance of the way you are with the change that you want to have occur. It operates through four modes, individual therapy, or in other words, IPT, group skills training to put it to use. Many therapists will also have telephone coaching. So if you had a challenging situation, you phone your therapist to see if you did it right. If you're an upcoming therapist, uh, if you have an upcoming event, you might contact your therapist to see if you're correctly applying or correctly planning to apply your skills. Consultation, the last one, you wouldn't know this is happening. Your therapist will be probably in therapy, which is typical, and also maybe consulting in terms of their guidance of you. Two heads are better than one. Of course, it's always anonymous. So anyway, these are the four modes. The next slide, we'll look at the four basic skill sets associated with DBT. If you have to listen to the slide, slide's kind of complex, so feel free to listen to it for time two, if that might be helpful. Let's consider the basic skills associated with DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, that is. One is mindfulness, which can be used separately or is also part of this particular skill set. It's not noting the feelings, the thoughts, even the behaviors that you're engaged in, bringing them to mind, becoming aware of many things that just pass through without your awareness. Once that you're aware of them and can accept them, Later on, you can work to changing them, but the first step is just acceptance. Another skill set is distress tolerance. Accepting that you're going to feel uncomfortable sometimes, whether it's anxiety, depression, stress, hopelessness, anger, irritation, what have you. Again, acceptance focused. If you can accept them later on, we can work on to changing them. Next one, emotional regulation. That is indeed change focused. Be able to change the hopelessness, the anxiety, the irritation. Be able to change that emotion. And yes, it is possible you will be given the skills to do that. 
in the last part of it would be interpersonal effectiveness, in part bringing you all together, but also learning the skills to work effectively with other people so you don't irritate them and so that you can help them work through their irritation to get to your goal that you have to do. This could be at the interpersonal level. This is also very useful at the job level. So a great skill set. In terms of the question, who is she? Just as an attempt to reinforce who she is, she's Marsha Linehan, the creator of DBT. We should know her name. This is a very, very important therapy. So we previously know that therapy works very well in conjunction with the biomedical treatments. Biomedical is a a term that we can use, but it's not an exclusive term. You could just call it biological treatments if you prefer. We talked uh, way early in the course about brain stimulation. Take a moment and see if you can remember what ECT, VNS, and DBS stand for. So ECT, hopefully you remembered electroconvulsive therapy, VNS, referring to the vagus nerve in the neck, so vagus nerve stimulation, and DBS, the least common and most invasive, deep brain stimulation. Are all three still used? Absolutely. As we noted, FDA approved for uh, depression uh, and sometimes for other conditions such as Parkinson's, uh, sometimes depending on the particular uh, technique, uh, OCD, and other conditions as well. We all know that exercise is good for our physical and mental health, but daily exercise can actually be approaching the effectiveness of medication. And often people who do engage in vigorous daily or near daily exercise need significantly less medication. Omega-3s have been shown to be helpful for some people and St. John's wort can also be useful but does interact with many medications so before you take St. John's wort if you're on any medications that are prescription you should consult with your pharmacist to make sure there no, won't be any interaction. And then lastly we'll focus on the different uh, medications for anti uh, for depression, in other words, the uh, antidepressants. So this will be our overview of the biological treatments on this particular slide. You might have noticed that I didn't mention TMS. I've recently added that to the slide. Do you know what it stands for? T would be for trans. M for magnetic, and S for stimulation. It's a rather unpleasant treatment. It's been likened to having your head tapped with a hammer, but it can, it is FDA, FDA approved for various conditions, including major depression, as well as uh, migraine headaches, and other conditions. So not pleasant, but for some conditions, it is worth it. Let's now consider the major family's antidepressant medications. The first to be discovered, approximately 1950, the MAOIs. And although teachers love acronyms, and I certainly do, uh, you do not necessarily need to know these letters. And if you're curious, it's monoamine oxidase inhibitors, but again, you don't need to know that. I would like you to know that it was discovered by serendipity. They first hoped it would work on schizophrenia. It did not but it did work on major depression. The early drugs had quite a few problems. There were numerous dietary restrictions, including uh, processed meat like pepperoni and sausage and things like that. Uh, you couldn't do beer, chocolate, many cheeses, and if you had a little bit of a sniffle and a cold, many of the cold drugs could also be very dangerous. But 
a bad family of drugs is better than none at all. More recent times is available in the patch form and all those restrictions of the past have not, now gone away. So nowadays it is an excellent medication choice. But we'll learn about that on the next slide. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. We'll also consider the tricyclics, the second generation antidepressants, which includes various families such as the SSRIs, the SNRIs, a standalone drug called Wellbutrin, and the newest kid on the block, the ketamine-based treatments. You'll notice that we don't have any anti-anxiety drugs, although antidepressants are useful in treating anxiety, anti-anxiety drugs are not useful in treating depression. So let's consider a family of drugs, the first family of antidepressants, and that was big by the way. Imagine having the first time ever a medication to treat depression. It was huge. Uh, MAOI stands for monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and no, you do not need to know that acronym. History involves serendipity, finding it by accident. Originally the drug was used for TB, but they happen to notice that people that had TB in depression, it not only helped the TB, it also helped ameliorate the depression. So serendipity found by accident. Used since the late 1950s. Helps about half of people with hard to treat, hard to treat depression. Remember our abbreviation PWTD, uh, persons with a disorder. A lot of words, it's easy to put. PWTD, so about helps, so helps half of people with hard to treat depression, and a little better for uh, more typical depression. Not a first choice of drugs uh, because of risk of something very potentially dangerous or deadly called serotonin syndrome. The original medications had many restrictions. Certain cheeses could be dangerous. Uh, certain pre preserved meats like pepperoni and that family of meats could be dangerous. Uh, you couldn't do chocolate. Uh, you couldn't do uh, certain alcohol beverages. You couldn't do certain cold drugs. So the rituals had many restrictions and if you ignore the restriction, you could end up seriously ill or possibly even hospitalize or die. But now we have new patch form and that uh, removes the restrictions that were present on the original family. You can see that I have listed the side effects and this is just for your interests. Uh, you do not need to memorize the side effects other than the fact that they're possible of serotonin syndrome which we'll discuss later. So again, huge that we have a medication family for depression. Huge! Let's now consider the second family, known as the tricyclics, or sometimes tricyclic antidepressants. History also involves serendipity. This medication family was first used to treat, attempt to treat schizophrenia, but they found that it was useful for depression. So again, found by accident. Used since the late 1950s, just slightly introduced later than the original MAOIs helps about 50 to 60 percent of persons with the disorder that is major depression. It works by altering both serotonin and norepinephrine, so focused on the same two neurotransmitters as the MAOIs. Issues would also include serotonin syndrome we mentioned for the MAOIs. Also something called uh, anticholinergic effects, which refer to acetylcholine, uh, which means that it can interfere with learning or memory. So probably not a first uh, medication choice for elderly people or people that have to learn a whole lot, like perhaps you in this class. Also has issues with heart toxicity, which would mean not a good medication choice for somebody that might be suicidal. And I do have some uh, other side effects listed. Uh, no, you don't need to know the other side effects beyond those three issues that we just noted.
Now let's consider our third family of antidepressants, the SSRIs. Take a moment and see if you can guess some of the letters. So SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. Basically, they work by keeping serotonin bouncing around the synaptic uh, uh, clefts, the synapses longer. So it's kind of like giving you more serotonin because what you have is in play longer, if that helps. They're also called the second generation antidepressants. There's many drugs in the family, but some of the more uh, famous ones and well used ones are Zoloft, Prozac, but maybe you've seen a commercial for Selexa. It also includes Lexapro again and many others. And unlike our earlier medications, targets only serotonin, hence the word selective in our first X. It has fewer side effects than the earlier families, so it's often uh, the first choice of administration for many physicians and therapists. But abrupt stopping of it can be dangerous and lead to something called serotonin syndrome that we'll consider fairly soon. Let's consider another medication in a typical family, the SNRIs. See if you can guess what those letters stand for. I think you can. I hope you all forgive me for being just a little bit lazy here. When I introduced the slide, I misspoke. The S is supposed to be serotonin, so please change that in your notes and mine. So serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors. Sorry about that. So you might be tempted to reason that if SSRI is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, then S NRI would be selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Uh, very logical, but sadly not so. Uh, this acronym stands for serotonin dash norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. There are four approved, but by far the most popular and associated with the greatest number of TV commercials from what I've seen would be Cymbalta and Effexor. There are some side effects listed below, some of the most uh, common ones. I just put that for your uh, information, but I would not expect you to know these particular side effects for any sort of test or quiz. Let's consider a family of drugs often referred to as the typicals. This slide focuses on a specific drug, Wellbutrin, and the next slide will focus on a family of drugs called the SNRIs. Now, Wellbutrin is different than the other neurotransmitters in that it works by focusing on dopamine as well as norepinephrine that is addressed in most of the other families. So again, the dopamine focus. So for people that have been prescribed the other families without success, maybe their depression is a little bit atypical and would need an atypical medication. Given the focus of the neurotransmitters it alters, do you think serotonin syndrome is an issue? Consider that for a moment. So since it does not alter or affect serotonin, no, it eliminates the risk of serotonin syndrome. But you might be saying, hmm, my mother's on that drug, or my, my significant other, or I'm on it for smoking cessation. Uh, that's another use of it. It is helpful for helping people to see smoking. You can see that there's a list of possible side effects. It's quite possible a person would have none of these, or maybe one of these, and they often go away if the person continues to use them. And again, uh, I'm not asking you to know any of these side effects for Wellbutrin. Let's 
sometimes considered the newest family of antidepressant drugs, the ketamine-based treatments. It's administered with a nasal spray, and unlike the other families of drugs we've considered so far, which often take weeks, two or three very commonly, to show significant uh, help, the ketamine-based effects are very rapid, often well within a few days. So it's the most effective of the treatments, even with treatment-resistant depression. But the effects are only short-term, so must be used with other treatments. So if a person is given a ketamine-based drug, they'll see improvement. And if they're taking a more traditional antidepressant at the same time, that will allow the traditional antidepressant time to kick in. At that point, ketamine can be removed. Uh, and it should be, typically, because it is addictive. So an option that will be very helpful for some individuals. So for some families of antidepressant drugs, serotonin syndrome is a dangerous possibility. The cause is too much serotonin in the brain it can happen if, uh, for some drugs, if St. John's wort is used at the same time. Uh, St. John's wort should not be used with other antidepressants. It can also be caused by the abrupt cessation of certain medications. So the doc you should always have a question to your doctor, uh, can I discontinue this medication? And for some medications, you'll have to be stepped down. I'd also mention for uh, St. John's wort, uh, it, it, interferes or interacts with many drugs, including uh, birth control pills. So it's not uncommon that a woman will take St. John's Worth with the birth control pills and find that she is pregnant because they interfered with the efficacy of that medication. So be forewarned. Again, don't use St. John's Worth with other medications unless you get okayed by your doctor and or pharmacist. Let's consider uh, the symptoms of serotonin and symptoms that might jump out at you. So later uh, down the list, you'll see things like sweating, shivering, or high fever. Nowadays, most of us would say, hmm, oh no, COVID. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Again, a lot of us would think COVID. So that's not really too helpful in diagnosing. But confusion or agitation, that's an unusual side effect. So that can indicate serotonin syndrome. Tremor, that's a very unusual side effect. Again, can suggest serotonin syndrome. Loss of coordination or twitching should be taken very serious. Again, possibly serotonin syndrome. Dilated pupils without assuming the person's not taking uh, recreational drugs, a very telling symptom. When these occur, the heart can become involved in terms of heartbeat issues. The person can uh, have heart failure, they can go into a coma, and they can die. So. If serotonin syndrome is suspected, this is not the sort of thing that you wait to the next day to see if it is or not. This is the sort of thing that if you suspect it, you need to seek immediate medical help. So let's consider the conclusions drawn in an article published by Kirsch in 2014. Right now, I'm going to read this particular slide. If you prefer this read on your own, perfectly fine. I'll go ahead and just jump to the next uh, symbol of the microphone. So according to Kirsch, antidepressants are, I've got to hop up here. Yeah, there. Antidepressants are supposed to work by fixing chemical imbalance, specifically a lack of serotonin in the brain. Indeed, their supposed effectiveness is the primary evidence for the chemical imbalance theory. The analysis of published data and the unpublished data that were hidden by drug companies reveals that most, if not all, of the benefits are due to the placebo effect. Some antidepressants increase serotonin levels, some decrease it, and some have no effect at all on serotonin. Nonetheless, they have the same therapeutic benefit. Even the small statistical difference between antidepressants and placebos may be an enhanced placebo effect due to the fact that most patients and doctors in clinical trials successfully figure out who's taking the drug and who's not based on the side effects. Kirshen concludes that the serotonin theory is as close to any theory in history of science 
to having been proved wrong. Pretty strong conclusion. So the often cited Kirsch article, as well as similar articles, question the fact that the antidepressants are useful and that they alter serotonin, and conclude instead that the effects are based on the placebo effect. A pretty strong conclusion. Consider this quote from an analysis published in 2017. If you're not for, uh, familiar with meta-analysis, they're absolutely great. They take all the literature published in journal articles at that particular time and they review them. So instead of just reading one specific article, you get the entire field of recent articles in one article. So they're very useful. But consider this conclusion. The SSRIs significantly increase the risk of both serious and non-serious adverse effects, I'm sorry, events. The potential small beneficial effects seem to be outweighed by the harmful effects. Again, a rather uh, surprising conclusion perhaps, uh, one that certainly the drug companies would not be happy with you thinking. Lastly, let's consider this earlier article published in 2010, uh, which uh, as you can see in the quotation, the largest antidepressant effectiveness trial ever conducted show that antidepressants are only marginally better compared to placebos, and even this modest benefit might be inflated by a profound publication bias. The authors recommend a reappraisal of the current recommended standard of care and depression. So am I suggesting you stop taking your antidepressants? Absolutely, positively not. If they're working for you, obviously continue to use them. And remember, sometimes abrupt cessation can lead to serotonin syndrome. Am I going to discourage you from taking antidepressants? Again, no, because for many people, the option is to do nothing or to take an antidepressant. Well, then antidepressants would probably be greatly preferable to doing nothing. But if these studies give you a pause, maybe consider the next slide. So if these slides, in fact, soured you on medications, well, perhaps think psychotherapy. But remember, most studies show the most improvement is seen for most conditions with people taking both the proper therapeutic medication and therapy. So again, perhaps your best option might be a mixture of both with a liberal amount of exercise sprinkled in. Let's now consider a family of disorders called the bipolar disorders. The prevalence is far from being the common cold of mental illness that unipolar depression was. The prevalence is about one to two percent. You probably know the other name. Take a moment. If you're thinking manic depression, that's absolutely correct. If you're not familiar with the term mania, think of it as being in most ways, not in every way, but in most ways being the opposite of depression. And we'll explore that more on the next slide or the slide after that as the case may be. In men, mania tends to occur first, which is good in that they're more likely to receive a correct diagnosis and a correct medication. Depression appears first in women, which is less fortunate because it could be easily confused with major depression, assuming that bipolar disorder doesn't run in her family and she's uh, aware of this disorder, her symptoms could be dis, uh, diagnosed as major depression and the medication she's given could actually make her illness worse. This particular disorder, although uncommon, accounts for 25% of completed suicides. So again, treatment is essential. We'll also consider that in the manic phase, Poor judgment is very typical, and we'll explore that more later. 
And the last idea for this slide, consider what you think rapid cycling could be. Uh, first consider, would it be talking in cycles per days or weeks or maybe months? And go ahead and guess the cycles. It's just a guess, but I thought it, you might want to do it. So a rapid cycle is defined in terms of years. And the person uh, would have four or, my, four or more cycles per year. Now, certainly some rapid cyclers can even cycle in one day. Uh, that would be very atypical. So again, it's defined as four or more cycles per years. There are three illnesses within the bipolar disorder family, bipolar disorder one, bipolar disorder two, and something called cyclothemic disorder. The difference? In bipolar one, the person has a full-blown manic episode, at least one, and at another point, full-blown major depression. For bipolar two, they never get to a fully manic episode. It's submanic, use the term hypomanic typically, so they have hypomania and also, at another point, major depression. So for the cyclothemia or cyclothemic disorder, they never even reach hypomania. It's kind of a sub-hypomania and they do not have major depression at all. So think of it as a chronic, long-lasting, sub hypomanic condition, and we'll see more later on in additional slides. In some, but not always, mania and depression are opposites. So go through this list of features on your own and see which you think are the same as major depression. Uh, that would be a yes. And which are the opposite of major depression. Uh, put a no. And when you're done with that, listen to the second recording. So all the features listed below were our features of major depression. So for each one, hopefully you put yes if it matches depression and no if it's opposite. So let's see how close a match it is. First one for mood, uh, that would be a no. So that would be opposite. Feeling worthless or feeling very guilty. Another depression feature. And you should have put no, again, opposite. Decrease in interest in no pleasure, characteristic of major depression, but decidedly not a feature of mania. So that would be a no, also an opposite. Fatigue. I uh, know, get the in image of maybe an Energizer Bunny in mania. Lots of energy. So that would be no. Weight change, usually decreasing. In mania, that would be a no. Although there's weight change, it usually increases. And if you got that wrong because of the arrow, then just ignore it. Uh, daily sleep change, it's usually increased in major depression. Usually decreases in uh, mania, so put it on no. And again, if you got it wrong because of the arrows, uh, don't sweat it. Motor symptoms. Restless, agitated, and slow. That would be the opposite uh, for mania. Partially. Restless and agitated often. Slow the opposite. So that one is just a iffy one. Maybe skip it all together would be the best option. And impaired thinking. In a very different way in mania. So we'll skip that one also. And we'll see uh, as we go on how the impaired thinking is very different. So in all ways, uh, but not every way, the features of mania are opposite of depression. This slide considers the features of bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorder, and specifically the diagnostic criteria. Three or more are needed. On the left-hand side, you see the bipolar features. For comparison, I put the matching feature for major depression on the right. So on the left, you'll see bipolar disorder often has increased self-esteem or what's called grandiosity, uh, 
grandiose. So for example, a person might land a perfect job after college and quit it saying, I can do better. How hard is it to be a Supreme Court justice after all and be serious? Decreased need for sleep is typical. Uh, as little as three hours or less, and it's not insomnia. They simply don't need to sleep. Change in weight, uh, typically in the direction of losing weight, if any, and not due to uh, feeling bad, just feeling too busy, too energized to eat. Thoughts racing or flights of ideas, which is very different from the slow, indecisive thoughts of major depression. Highly distractible because ideas are jumping around so much. Increase in activity levels, uh, often doing many projects at once, often getting none done. Compared to major depression, fatigue, and often uh, not engaging in expected behaviors. And major depression, also no pleasure in thoughts of death, which is very different than uh, bipolar disorder. You'll see also the criteria for bipolar disorder behaviors that will end badly. So extreme shopping sprees, extreme sexual sprees, bad judgment like being contacted online by an unknown person and engage, trying to engage in business with them and so on. So basically judgment showing a very poor behavior. Let's now consider the third disorder in the bipolar disorder family, that of cyclothemic disorder, sometimes called cyclothemia. It's a chronic subhypomania. In other words, the person never gets manic. The person never even gets fully hypomanic. So it's less than hypomania and with no major depression. And if you look at the bottom, take a guess. How long do you think it has to be present? A full two years. So think of it as chronic low grade mania. Let's consider the various treatments for bipolar disorder. Unquestionably, best is a combination of meds and psychotherapy. Dialectical behavior therapy is particularly useful. Focusing on the meds, an older but still used drug is lithium. It's typically not the first choice. It's very difficult to uh, administer, too little and effective, too much can be toxic, so it's used as a second choice. The first choice would be mood stabilizers, which can also be called the anti-convulsants, useful in epilepsy as well as bipolar disorder. There's the newer atypical antipsychotics, perhaps you've seen the commercials, Abilify, a Seroquel, sometimes used for schizophrenia as well as bipolar disorder. Now there are big problems with people with bipolar disorder with non-compliance, not taking the meds, particularly when they slide into hypomania or mania. They feel good, they don't want to take the meds, and it often leads to a dis disastrous cycle of perhaps job loss, relationship loss, and uh, the results of very poor choices. There's also a problem with relapses. Now remember we saw in mania, poor judgment is typical. So a person, for example, uh, that's very cheap normally might max out all their credit cards. A person that would never have an affair might have one when they're in a manic phase. A person that's a careful driver and drives even too slow might become reckless in speed while manic. So for many of these reasons, that poor judgment, the person often does not comply with medication, which can be very, very damaging to say the least. After you've studied the slides for the PowerPoints for this chapter, Go ahead and see if you can answer these and listen to the answer. The ones you get wrong, take time and just focus on these. And then every so often, do the entire list, especially just before the major test. This will let you know how well you do or don't know the content of this chapter, at least most of it, and which 
aspects you really need to focus on so you can do superbly on the test like you want to. So let's see how you did. Had many diet restrictions and cold medication restrictions for that matter. That was the first family of antidepressants ever, the MAOIs, heart toxic. So not good for potentially suicidal depressed people. Uh, that would be the tricyclics. The TCA stands for tricyclic antidepressants. SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. TCAs affect the standard neurotransmitters, that is serotonin and norepinephrine. The MAOIs affect the standard neurotransmitters for depression, uh, serotonin and norepinephrine. Uh, SSRIs, they're selective to serotonin, so only serotonin. The SNRIs, N for norepinephrine, so they're selective to norepinephrine. Well, butrin, very different, affects dopamine and norepinephrine. Not good for people who have strong learning needs or have perhaps memory issues, so not good for the elderly, and definitely not good for college students unless there are no other good choices. Uh, that would be the TCAs. Anticholinergic relates to the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, very involved in memory. Has fewer side effects and includes such famous drugs like Zoloft and Prozac and others. Well, that would be the SSRIs. So go back and study the ones that gave you trouble and then maybe do it again. And again, don't forget to do it immediately prior to your first test on this material. After you've studied the slides for the PowerPoints for this chapter, go ahead and see if you can answer these and listen to the answer. The ones you get wrong, take time and just focus on these. And then every so often, do the entire list, especially just before the major test. This will let you know how well you do or don't know the content of this chapter, at least most of it, and which aspects you really need to focus on so you can do superbly on the test like you want to. Let's see how you did. SAD, Seasonal Affective Disorder, and we remember that affect means mood. PMDD, Premenstrual Dysphoric Disorder. Other names for major depression would be major depressive disorder or unipolar depression. How many cycles? It would be in a time period of one year, four cycles. A person with a disorder that which has low grade hypomania for two plus years and no major depression, uh, that would be cyclothemic disorder or sometimes called cyclothemia. A person with a disorder has periods of mania and depression, that would be bipolar disorder one. As compared to hypomania and major depression, that would be bipolar disorder two. And the newest family of treatments for major depression would be the ketamine family. So uh, take a look at how you did and focus now on the ones that gave you trouble. And then you remember to go back and do this at least once or twice, twice immediately before your first test.